So, you've come back. You enjoyed part one enough to actually see what the top ten was. I'm impressed. Well, let me not waste your time. Here is part two slash top ten, Sega CD games. Slipheed is a shooter unlike any other for the system, and possibly unlike any shooter of the era. Its weird blend of FMV backgrounds and 3D polygonal graphics, a unique weapon system, and Kruber banter during levels brought a shooter experience unlike any scene then, and it was still wrapped in a familiar 2D shmup style. Slipheed is a pseudo-sequel or remake, depending on who you ask, to the game of the same name released on many home computers in 1988. The game was solid, but was simplistic and was slightly unbalanced, but it was enjoyable. However, in 1993, a new version of the game was made exclusively for the Sega CD, and really did something unique with the hardware. Melding pre-rendered FMV backgrounds with simple, minimal colored polygonal graphics allowed for the FMV to look clean and crisp, and allowed the ships to pop against it. Even more impressive, many of the boss enemies and obstacles would be rendered in the FMV background and properly given hitboxes to make the backgrounds more than just window dressing. Though, the backgrounds add a lot of variety and work very well as window dressing as well, with area and stages many space shooters only dream of at the time. However, what can't be understated is the impressive variety of weapon options you have. Not only does each weapon you can select for your main firing have its own benefits and detriments, but there is also another set of sub-weapons, each with their own different abilities and even ammo count. You unlock this by hitting score goals, which was a different way to earn new weapons, and encourage you to try and kill as many enemies as possible in order to quickly earn new abilities. The final push of greatness that this game offers is in its sound design. The game boasts a fantastic soundtrack, and the game also, as aforementioned, adds crew banter throughout the battle, which really kept the game lively. The game was a feast to the eyes and ears, and most importantly was an absolute blast to play. Next time you see it, don't let this one slip out of your hands. Sega has a lot of franchises that have been left to languish in their library, but not many were as popular and as quickly abandoned as Eternal Champions. The most tragic part of that is, Eternal Champions Challenge of the Dark Side, the Sega CD director's cut of the first game for the Sega Genesis, improved on many of the issues of this game, did some innovative things for fighting games, and most importantly was a blast to play. In this game, a being called the Eternal Champion took many people who died before their time that were meant to do great things, and brought them back together to fight for the ability to be given a second chance, and bring the changes they were meant to. They did this by basically having a Mortal Kombat tournament, fatalities and all. I never said it was totally original. What separated this game from so many clones at the time was that it kind of married the two most popular games, Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat. It had the technicality and the gameplay of a Street Fighter game, but it was much more gory and had the kind of tone of the Mortal Kombat games. Each character was also very unique and had fighting styles based on real martial arts, which the game talked about in great detail in both the manual and the game, in all the lore and bios you could check out. The presentation and depth of the story was incredible for a fighting game at the time, long before games like Soul Calibur and Tekken offered deep stuff like that for single player, and it made it easy to find a character to call your favorite. Pile onto this an immense amount of secrets like different fatalities, hidden characters, and much more, and long before games like Dead or Alive or Mortal Kombat's later entries would offer such diversity in its secrets, and Eternal Champions left something new to discover each playthrough. For fans of a good round of fisticuffs, it was truly the only choice for the Sega CD. Musha is one of the most sought-after Sega Genesis carts out there, and generally seems one of the best shooter experiences from the Elise series in the US. Sadly, somehow this game always manages to overshadow its successor, Robo Elise, its Sega CD sequel. Robo Elise is about as good as classic 90s top-down shooters get. Honestly, talking about it is hard since nothing the game does is truly all that different, but it does it all so very well. You have a main weapon that becomes more powerful as you collect chips that build up its abilities, and two side-firing ships that have four unique sub-weapons you can collect, and certainly you'll find one to suit your playstyle. You can also chuck your side-ships at enemies, which is great in a pinch. The feudal setting with mechs and technology mixed in did give the game a different look than many shooters at the time, and its soundtrack matched the theme, giving a bit of techno-metal love to a feudal-esque sound of music. It's a great soundtrack that blends perfectly with the game's style. And the game also has great cutscenes and a solid story told throughout the game, something not very often seen in shooters, especially in the early era. 
However, the game ranks on the list by just playing super well. The controls are tight, the difficulty finds that perfect, challenging, but not unfair difficulty curve, and mixes fantastic aesthetic elements to keep you engaged through all of its 12 stages. Robo at least is just a really good game, and sometimes that's all you need to be. Groovy still pretty accurately describes Earthworm Jim. Made in the height of the mascot platformer craze, Earthworm Jim ended up on every platform it could possibly get to, and even had enough popularity and a following to get to Saturday morning. It's pretty fun! When ported into the Sega CD, it got an enhanced port that, well, only adding lots of small improvements and a new level, was still the version to get. Earthworm Jim Special Edition proves that even games that seem incredibly of their time can stay classic, and why Earthworm Jim manages to stand head and shoulders above the many forgotten mascot characters. Unlike many other mascot platformers, it has slightly more to do with games like Contra and Metal Slug, as it had many running gun elements to it, while still retaining many great platforming segments that can still hang with the big guns. Both pieces get to shine, neither overshadowing the other. Not only that, but each level felt completely unique from the last, with many unique stage gimmicks, memorable boss encounters, zany humor, and tight gameplay. Unlike mascot games like Arrow the Acrobat, Boogerman, Bubsy, and so on, Earthworm Jim survives by being built as its own game. It doesn't try to be gross or try pandering too much to the Tood era or just trying to straight up be a Mario or Sonic clone. It's its own game that, while very much being a product of its time, manages to encapsulate what made the time and genre great and then adds its own unique touch, and that's what makes it become timeless. Groovy. Sonic CD may seem like the most cliché choice for a best of Sega CD list, but there is a reason it's a staple of so many. Becoming the next big project for Sega's Sonic team, after Yuji Naka and many key members left to help Sega Technical Institute make Sonic 2 proper, Sonic CD was meant to just be a port of that game. However, at some point during the development of that port, the game was eventually retooled into an entirely new game. This would become one of the most beloved and critically praised games in the series, and that claim is totally true. From an interesting time travel mechanic that forced you to explore the stages, but still gave you plenty of places to run fast and feel the blast processing, to the introduction of popular mainstays like Amy Rose and Metal Sonic, and a soundtrack that has caused about as much debate within the Sega community as the Nintendo vs. Sega debate, as the entire soundtrack was retooled from the Japanese version. You may say this Japanese soundtrack is better, but without the complete retooling, we never have Sonic Boom. Think about that. With some brilliant level design, fantastic boss battles, and some nice animated cutscenes added in to take advantage of the Sega CD's lauded FMV capabilities, Sonic CD was a truly new experience that was never really attempted or replicated again in the series. This was the first time that the Sonic formula would try to evolve, as it has many times over the years, to mixed results. However, on the first try to keep the basics in place but shake things up, they came out with something unique yet still familiar, and a hell of a lot of fun. As I talked about in the review for the game, Lords of Thunder is one of my all-time favorite shooters, and one of the best on the Sega CD, a system with quite a few solid shooters to its name. For me, Lords of Thunder wins mainly on style. With its amazing heavy metal soundtrack, and its awesome anime-influenced graphics, its solid power-up mechanics, and the store where you can spend collected jewels on power-ups for the next level and beyond, all of this combines to give the game a unique feel that no other shooter has ever replicated. While it may be a bit on the easy side, and has some minor sound issues, there is nothing quite like Lords of Thunder in the genre or on the Sega CD. It helps elevate it from a great shooter to an excellent one, and a game that I think should be in every Sega CD collector's collection. Working Design is one of the most beloved publishers in the 90s bringing over a lot of cult RPGs that normally wouldn't have been seen here otherwise, with fun translations and really great packaging. Walking Design started out on the Sega CD and made its name for itself there, and it's easy to see why. Vi, a generic RPG by most standards, was brought alive by Walking Design's fun and witty dialogue. 
However, Vi was the second title they released on the system. Before this, Working Design brought us the excellent Lunar the Silver Star, a great RPG that just made even better with their localization. The game is about the quest of Alex on his way to becoming one of the legendary Dragon Masters, someone who uses the power of the four dragons who protect the four elements. These Dragon Masters use these powers to protect the goddess Athena, who helped keep humanity alive after they rendered the Blue Star inhabitable, a place like planet Earth, by helping them relocate to the Silver Star, a new planet. Alex has dreamed of becoming one of the Dragon Masters after hearing of all the great stories of his idol Dine, and it's this legendary character in Alex's pursuit of his dream that are the catalysts for the game. The story brings a villain that you can feel for and is fantastically written, among many characters that all stand on their own and have unique goals and motivations. Party members will move in and out constantly, but it all seems very appropriate when they do, as their quests is not always yours. Both the Lunar games are excellent on the system, but my attachment leans slightly towards the first one, as the plot was far more enjoyable for me. The game offers a charming old school RPG with turn based combat, spells, attacks, all the basics you've come to expect. Unlike many RPGs of the time, the visuals on screen dictated actions, so when your character would flee to avoid close range hits, the equivalent to guarding or defending in any other game, it would actually show this action, as the battles were animated in a battlefield with movement. It made each battle feel far more alive than most other RPGs of the time that just had static images. The world itself, as even mentioned by the creators at Game Arts, was given a more northern feel. What this meant was, the game had more mountains, more greens, and a world that felt much more natural and grounded in reality. It had its magical elements, to be sure, but this didn't feel all that removed from something you would see in a northern European country. At the time, a JRPG with a setting like this was not a common sight. Of course, the game truly wouldn't be that special without its presentation. Even without mentioning working design, the music is beautifully orchestrated and plays more of a role in the game than you may think. For the time, the voice acting is quite good, with all characters sounding natural and truly putting in a great effort, and those moments you have animated cutscenes really shine and show just how impressive the Sega CD could be. Most importantly though, is that script by Vic and company. Working design, while still remaining faithful to the original game, brought every character from shopkeeps to one-off NPCs to the main party to life with a fun, lighthearted script that made pop culture references, meta jokes, and just genuinely entertaining writing that every character encountered was a treat to see. Of course, again, none of this came at the expense of the story, and the dramatic moments were also well written and very tense. Luna the Silver Star doesn't light the RPG world on fire with the game, but with some interesting little tweaks, a fun world that was a bit unique for the time, and the fantastic working design translation, it was the RPG that defined the Sega CD, and began a legacy that would soon be welcomed on the PlayStation and beyond. However, Lunar all started with this version on the Sega CD, and it's the one that I'll always love the most. Shining Force CD is possibly the weak century in the Shining Force series proper, before the series was rebooted on the DS and PSP. With the series as fantastic as this, that isn't much of an insult, and as you can notice, why it still ranks so high on this list. Unlike the first two games, this was a compilation of four campaigns. The first two are remakes of the first two Game Gear Shining Force Gaiden games, with the third campaign acting as an epilogue, and the fourth book being a single bonus mission that I won't ruin for you here, but all I can say is, if you finish it, you are hard fucking core. <sighs> Once more, while the second Gaiden Game Gear game was released here as the Sword of Hyja, the first Game Gear Gaiden was never released here, making this the only way to play the original in the US. However, these side stories still had plenty of the bite that made the main series so great. First getting two games for the price of one, and then some? The game gave you all a lot of bang for your buck, making it as big as Shining Force 1 and 2 combined. While it lacked many of the improvements Shining Force 2 had, the interesting classes and promotion system, accessible turn-based gameplay, and the wonderful anime fantasy setting and music that was synonymous with the entire Shining series of games was all still intact. With so much content that you needed to own the backup memory cart just to store all the saved data, Shining Force CD is certainly one of the meatiest games in the system, and even though the oddball title in the series, no less befitting of the name. Outside of Sonic CD, many argue that Snatcher defined the Sega CD. Given the pedigree, the game's value on the second-hand market, and the general quality of the game, it's a well-deserved title. 
At the time, it was one of the first true visual novel style games to officially be brought to the US, and was also Kojima's first work to be released here. The NES port of Metal Gear didn't have any direct involvement from Kojima, and he since called it an inferior port, so we're not counting it. The story of Snatcher placed you in the shoes of Gillian Seed, joining a task force called Junker to combat the titular Snatchers. These Snatchers will kill their victim and then take their body and meld seamlessly back into society. There has been a large outbreak of these cases in New Kobe City, the place you are being sent to. Of course, like many characters, you have amnesia and a weird connection to the Snatchers that is not yet known. And if all this sounds just a tad bit familiar, you may have seen the movie Blade Runner. It is very clear this movie not only for the story, but aesthetically takes quite a bit from it. Like Kojima will become known for, the story is deep and complex, but could also be completely goofy and have fun with itself, like the scene in the club with all the Konami characters. This never really takes away from the story at large or ever downplays things, but it does leave the story to have its own unique feel that only Kojima could come with. The gameplay itself, like many adventure games and visual novels, is not a lot more than clicking on things and talking to people until an event is triggered that allows the story to progress. However, to keep trigger-happy players placated, or just because Kojima always liked to do something different, the game includes shooting segments. Though they were simple, they were made way cooler if you looked up a Konami Justifier to play them. This made the shooting segments that much more involved and enveloped you that much more into the world. However, for me, the true shining star of the game wasn't the story at large, but the characters of the story, and their interactions with each other. Whether it was discussions with Jamie, your ex-wife who also shares a case of the forgetful, or dealing with your assertive yet slightly flirtatious secretary of Junker, Mika, or even your little buddy Metal Gear who acted as your partner throughout the game. He may be a bit literal, since he is just a computer, but it is clear he has a personality and heart of his own. These characters, among many others I don't have time to cover, and the way they interact with each other, the city, and the situations handed to them, is what truly set Snatcher up as one of the best games on the Sega CD, and as a cult classic that would be the launching point in America for one of the most prolific video game developers of all time. If you ever get the chance to play it, do so. It's sure to snatch away time instantly. When I started this list, I had so many games that I wanted to choose. As I do this quick intro bit, you'll see games that didn't make the cut, because honestly, there are so many great titles to like on the Sega CD. Narrowing a list down to 20 was actually a much harder task than I ever expected. However, when I started writing it all out, only one thing was in place. I knew what game would be number one. The game that made me want a Sega CD as a kid. The game that started to get me interested in anime. And most importantly, would be my most sought after game when I started collecting Sega four years ago. And that title, the game that brought me that much joy, and the number one game on my list, is Popful Mail. Popful Mail came courtesy of Yis developer Falcom, and the amazing folks at Working Design doing the US localization and publishing. The game actually had a long journey on its way to the US, as Sega originally planned to publish it with a Sonic reskinning. But due to fan demand, or a change in priorities, dropped the idea, and worked with Working Design to bring the game as is to the US. Of course, this isn't to mention its origins on Japanese home computers, or the ports to other popular 16-bit consoles in Japan, like the PC Engine CD and the Super Famicom. Considered by the devs to be a working of their two franchises at the time, East and Dragon Slayer, Popful Mail was a unique blend of a platformer and action RPG, not unlike the popular Monster World series. While there is no proper leveling, you do gain new weapons and items throughout the game, through completing levels, finding treasures, or buying them with money looted from enemies at shops. There are also side quests you can find as you explore the large areas in the game, which all have various rewards should you complete them. The game puts you in the role of Mail, a female elvish bounty hunter who was down on her luck over continually being foiled by Nuts Cracker. While traveling in the city, she gets a tip about a bounty on a powerful wizard named Muttonhead. Her quest to capture the huge bounty and find fame and fortune turns into an adventure to save the world. Of course. Along the way, you'll meet up with two more playable characters that you'll be able to switch out at any time. There is Tat, a former apprentice of Muttonhead, who Mail eventually allows to be a traveling companion in the hopes of being helpful in her quest, and Gaw, a tiny purple dragon winged creature who also eventually joins the party in order to strike out and make a name for himself, along all the other Gaws. Each character has different attack, speed, and health, which means each will have their uses throughout the course of the game. 
Popful Male oozes charm out of every corner. The cute visuals during gameplay are fun, but the character visuals during dialogue and cutscenes are what truly bring this game to life. Unlike Lunar, which has a serious tone, Popful is played for laps pretty much the whole way through. From bosses that are straight up lifts to Australian bodybuilders, characters that fit every anime archetype, and just simple charming NPCs, every character interaction is worth seeking out. Popful Male doesn't have a lot of meat to its gameplay, but what is there is refined, fun, and challenging. The presentation, though, elevates it to something truly grand. A world that you constantly want to get lost in. And for me personally, it sets sparks off into looking for more games like it, and for anything that captured the spirit of it, which I eventually found to be Slayers, an anime that would take me from just being a casual anime fan into something much bigger. All in all, Popful Mail is the game I have the fondest memories of, the most fun playing still, and had the most impact on me, not only as a gamer, but as a person. It's the only game I could think of as number one. Hey guys, thanks so much for sticking around for the second part to come out. I know it took a little bit to get out there, but I'm really happy to have it done, and I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, if you didn't see part one for any reason, you can check it out here in the link. Otherwise, feel free to some enjoy some other videos, and just really, again, thanks for being patient and waiting those things, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in the next video, and it won't be two months away.